Well, first of all, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, Ask the Experts webinar. This is the second webinar in the two-part series that we do for the MRC Maps Proof Science Writing Award. Um, these webinars are aimed to uh, kind of give you tips and you know advice from experts on how to write a very good article for your submissions uh, for uh, the award. Uh, and to kind of answer any questions you may have from the guidelines or from the process or anything like that. Um, so let me just quickly share my screen here. And then I will get started. So um, this, uh, on today's webinar, we have uh, Joining us again, two of our VIP judges, Andy Ridgway, who is a journalist and senior lecturer in science communications at UWE Bristol, and Dr. Roger Highfield, who is the M an MRC council member and also the science director of the Science Museum Group. Um, so thank you both for joining. Um, so, and I'm Gerard Hassan. Uh, I'm the MRC content manager, and I also lead on the organization uh, of Max Prude Science Writing Award. This is my second year leading uh, this award. And just to give you some um, housekeeping things, this entire webinar will be recorded just like the last one was, and then we'll share these with you. You will get an email, everyone that's registered for both webinars will get an email from me this week with links to both the recordings, and then we'll also upload them to our YouTube channel uh, later on and share them via Twitter and put them on the guidelines on our webpage for the competition. So uh, several ways of sharing this, but all of you that have registered will get this by, the, by this week. Uh, the, we were meant to have a special guest this uh, uh, for this webinar. I did promise that in the last one. Uh, I, have, I have to bite my own tongue now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Sarah Taylor, the 2020 uh, award winner, was uh, was going to join us, but uh, due to a last minute uh, scheduling conflict, she had to uh, drop out of it. Uh, so, but Sarah was very kind to give us um, some slides that we're going to share with you, uh, giving her top five tips. Uh, from her perspective as a former uh, a winner, but also as a PhD student of the, you know, what she, what kind of advice she uh, thought was the best things to kind of give you. So you can then use those to write a very uh, successful uh, article. Um, following, uh, so I'll start off with the tips. And once we're done with the tips, uh, we'll go into the uh, uh, a series, this entire webinar is based on uh, the questions received from everyone uh, when they registered. And we've kind of created a, a, a various themes we'll cover. So I'll cover uh, the themes of formatting and just some general gui uh, guideline information. And then I'll hand it over to Andy and Roger who will then uh, follow up with uh, a couple of themes on their end. Uh, then we'll, around the half hour mark, We'll open it up for a Q&A session, which will last about 25 minutes, depending on the volume of questions uh, everyone still has. And hopefully we can cover all of that. Uh, if you could just hold your questions until then, and then when we get to that point, use the Q&A feature in Zoom to uh, send us your questions. And then at the end, I'll just wrap up with some uh, reminders, uh, key reminders, and that'll be the full hour. Uh, so to start off, I'll start off with the tips that Sarah provided. So these are the top five tips from the 2020 award winner, Sarah Taylor. Um, tip number one, simplify your ideas. Uh, Sarah says that it's very tempting to, you know, write everything that is encompassed in your project. And this is actually a trap that you can fall into. Uh, it's much better to take a small part that you can really talk well about and take it point to point with a clear uh, goal at the end. Uh, this stops you from writing, uh, from your writing from becoming too complicated and too long. Uh, you know, do remember that this is, there is a word limit. Uh, you have 1100 words, including the title. So this will help you kind of keep your focus. Uh, tip number two, consider your audience. 
Uh, throughout the, her writing process, Sarah went to her family and friends, especially those that, that were had a non-scientific background, to kind of ask them questions like, hey, do you know what a BRCA gene is? Do you know what protein is? Or do you know what DNA is? And she was surprised by the fact of how some, you know, how little sometimes people remember even basic science from high school. So, but this really helped her to kind of understand what her audience needed uh, to have better explained or what information, even what information they didn't need. So she could take away things that she thought was, you know, giving a lot of good background, but was really unnecessary or, and then kind of better define or explain certain terms that were not clear. Um, this helped her to sometimes cut things entirely from her drafts. This goes into tip number three really well, which is editing is your friend. You know, don't be afraid to make big changes from that original draft that you have or that original essay plan you have in your mind. Uh, Sarah did various iterations. Uh, it's, you know, her, her, the first draft she had started out is very different to what she ended up submitting and then what ended up be becoming the winning article. You know, uh, so sometimes, you know, things might be too complex at first, but once you get that audience feedback, uh, you will be able to uh, tailor it better to your audience. So, you know, don't be afraid to edit. Tip number four, uh, with an article like this, uh, that's gonna be published in the Observer, you know, uh, you know make it personal. You know, it, this is not a research paper. This is not a thesis. You know, you can't really talk about all the various aspects of your work uh, you know, there, you know, so, you know, you need to focus on a specific area. So ask yourself critical questions like what is important to you in your project? Uh, you know, what interests you? What is an element within your project or your research that you're really passionate about? And try to incorporate that into your writing and be creative with it. Um, Sarah wanted to talk about her translational aspects of her research and how the lab work they did, uh, you know, what the results were or the outcomes were to the clinical patients that she dealt with. And this was really something that motivated her. So she made sure that this was something she uh, wrote about in her, uh, in her article and made that the focus. You know, don't fall into the trap of writing too much uh, about what has already been done in your field. Remember, you don't want this article to feel like, a, you know, uh, some kind of uh, review paper. You know, we're not asking you for a general review of your field. We're asking you about a specific aspect of your project, even if you don't have results and you haven't been in the lab or your first year. Regardless of that, something that you are passionate about that's specific to your research and your project, and then give relative background where it's needed and is helpful. Uh, and finally, tip number five, uh, you don't have to start from the beginning. Uh, Sarah says it's easy to get bogged down explaining too much background and being too caught up in that, and that kind of will actually affect the st structure and balance of your paper. So she says, write what you really want to write about. You know, start with the main piece, the main story, and then once you've got, used the other tips, you know, gone to your audience for for uh, insight and then done editing, you'll realize that okay maybe that background is not needed and maybe this is needed. So you're only putting in what's actually going to add to that main story. Um, so those are uh, the top, top five tips from Sarah Taylor. Uh, and they're really helpful, I think. And they really, uh, a lot of the questions we received uh, from all of you, uh, her tips answered so many of them that we were really, we were really happy with that. Um, so, Going from Sarah's tips, uh, I will cover now a few things on the questions around formatting that we received. Um, so uh, in regards to formatting, I would uh, advise everyone, if you haven't already, to really read the 2021 guidelines. You know, we make everything about formatting, what's required, word limits, font, and things like that, uh, very clear in the guidelines. So, you know, it's, it, it's beneficial to you to make sure you read that thoroughly because at the end of the guidelines, it tells you how to enter uh, uh, before, after telling you all these things. Uh, remember, it's 1,100 words, uh, we, including the title. Uh, we are not asking for uh, any graphs or any uh, charts or anything like that, illustrations. Remember, the winning article will be published in the Observer, so we, are, we have to meet certain criteria that the Observer wants so they can publish 
So uh, make sure not to you know, waste space on illustrations or graphs and things. They're unnecessary. Just 1,100 words is what we're looking for. Uh, remember, this is not a research paper. You don't have to give a bibliography or a referencing page. Uh, we're not asking for those things. Um, you know, you may make references to, uh, to someone within the article itself. Oh, like, you know, say, oh, the work being done here, if that's relevant to the background you want to give. But other than that, we're not looking for you to give a full uh, reference page or anything like that. Um, the other thing I want to cover is there was a question on uh, animal research. So the MRC is very open about the importance of animal research uh, following this, the uh, latest government and ethical guidelines while doing animal research, but also be very transparent about this. You know, uh, we want to be open about the animal research that's done, what we're doing uh, uh, to kind of reduce uh, these following three R's. Uh, so if your uh, research involves uh, animal models or animal research, be open and direct about that. You know, there's no reason to kind of talk around the subject. There's no reason to hide it. Uh, we would encourage you to be transparent about that and, you know, talk about why you, it's necessary for your work. Uh, so, you know, those are the two things I really want to cover in my points. Uh, I will now hand it over to Andy uh, who will then cover some questions. Andy? Terrific, thanks Jura. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna answer a few of the questions that have been sent in um, before this session and Jura has done an excellent job of picking out some kind of key, key themes within that. But as he said, look, if there's any, any kind of burning questions that you have at the end of this um, that you still want to ask them, feel free to ask them. And there's time for that. So the first question I'm going to address uh, is uh, what's more important, the creativity of the article um, or the importance of the research? What I'd say on that is that both are important. Um, and I don't mean to be flippant about that. But um, what I mean by that is that um, I think those two elements aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. In other words, in doing one, doesn't prevent you from doing the other. So you can be both um, creative, engaging in telling your story about your research, but while also conveying the importance of the research. And I think I think that's quite important. So in the in the last session, I you know I, I pointed to films. You know, think about films that you've enjoyed watching, uh, and whether you can uh, use some of the creativity in storytelling that's applied in films. To, to tell the story of, of your research and whether that's, you know, a, a kind of a, an opening scene that's captivating and intriguing um, or whether you have a, a kind of a, a main protagonist, uh, you know, who's on a quest for kind of the truth, a discovery, uh, enlightenment or whatever it is. You know, and that main protagonist could be a patient or it could be you. It could be your quest, um, you know, to, to find answers to a question. So you can still be, it's important to be creative um, and also convey why your research matters. And I think um, Sarah made a good point, actually, um, in, in the things that she addressed earlier on, in that what she was saying is, remember that it's not a review paper. So when you're explaining why your research matters um, to your supervisor or in other pieces of written work, normally for your PhD, whether it's a progression review or something else, what those people reading that text want to know is that you have a good understanding of the research field and it's a comprehensive understanding so that any research you do is adding new knowledge. But that's one purpose. When we're looking at an article for the observer, it's really so that an observer readers understands the place of your research, which is quite different. They're not experts in the field. They're intelligent, but they aren't immersed in that area of research like your supervisor is. So often then it, it, it means kind of drawing on what's going on in the outside world to a far greater extent. Um, why does this research matter? You know, why is this, is this a sort of prevalent condition that, that, um, that, it's, uh, that you're looking to treat or one that has obviously, you know, severe uh, implications for people involved? What's it like for those involved? 
all of those sort of everyday relatable aspects are so important in conveying why your research matters but can be integral to the story that you tell and the creativity that you apply um, as well. So, um, yeah, as I say, I wasn't trying to be flippant, but, but I think it's, it is possible to be both creative um, and also convey uh, the importance of your research as well. Uh, so that's, that's one question. So the next one I want to look at uh, is, um, I have lots of ideas on how to start. Um, any tips on wrapping up? So finishing the article. And to be honest, no matter how long you've been writing, that's often quite tricky. Um, you often sometimes just want to say, ta-da, the end, that's it, kind of, you know, <laughs> um, that would be an easy way of doing it, but probably not a very constructive one. Um, but it is quite difficult because, you know, quite often you feel you've conveyed lots of the important stuff earlier on. But a few tips, uh, let's, let's be kind of constructive about it, just to sort of acknowledge that it is quite challenging. Um, I think the important thing is that you don't let the end of the article just fizzle out. Um, you know, sometimes I read uh, articles, often, you know, professionally written articles, and the full stop at the end of a sentence, and I turn the page to potentially sort of read on, and that's it. It's just kind of vanished into the ether. There's no kind of end point. So it is important to have an end point. Sometimes that can be you pointing towards the next steps. So what are the next questions that, that need to be answered and addressed? But what I would say with that is please avoid saying more research is needed um, because that would apply to any research and it's a bit of a cop out. So um, be specific, you know, what specifically in your domain needs to happen next. And what could it lead to? What's the potential? Um, allow readers to see what might happen if all of this comes to fruition. I, mean, I, mean, I know, you know, we're encouraged within research to be kind of cautious about that and understandably so, but there's no harm. Ultimately, you have a goal and let's be positive. You know, what could it mean for, for the people who your research relates to? Uh, how could it transform their lives? What, what, what changes might it bring? Um, Another common approach is to kind of loop back to something that you introduced right at the start of the article. So say, for instance, you know, you're describing a scene with a patient in a waiting room, nervously waiting for the results of a, a, um, um, a, an, an, an investigation. Or it might be you in a lab, you know, frustrated that a machine's not worked again or that you just have you know something's not right and you don't know what it is you're not getting the results that you expected by the end can you kind of loop back to that opening scene and shed new light on that does it allow us to see that thing in a new way and that can be a really effective way to make the article feel really coherent and really well thought together to take your readers on that journey and then re-remind them of that, of that opening scene and and allow them to see that in a new light maybe so th those can be sort of quite effective ways so again there's a bit of creativity that you could apply uh, in, in, in that aspect so the final question um, that I was going to address is um, do you have any advice for students whose native language um, is in English uh, yeah so there's a few tips um, so the first one being um, quite often when you're learning, I'm speaking from personal experience here, quite often when you're learning a new language uh, and you're not familiar with it, um, the phraseology that you use in your written work tends to be quite formal. Um, and I think quite deliberately so because, you know, um, you're being taught to use a fuller vocabulary. But in this form of writing that we're asking you to do, it's perhaps a little bit more conversational, a bit more as you would explain it, you know, the classic thing, a very British way of explaining this, explain it to like how you would explain it to a friend down the pub. How would you tell them about your research? So an intelligent friend who perhaps has a passive interest in your own research, conversations dried up. What can you tell them about? OK, I'll tell them about my research. How in a conversational way would you talk to them about your research? And that's the kind of tone, a slightly conversational way. So, I mean, Roger mentioned this last week, actually. It's a really good tip is to read out loud what you've written. And often that's a good way to find sentences and phrases that you've used that 
aren't that are quite stilted and quite formal and just not as people would speak because probably you're quite used to using English in, in you know sort of uh, speaking it so you'll you'll hear those those aspects of, a, of of what you've written that aren't quite right um you could also ask a friend or um anyone else that you know a colleague who is a native English speaker to have a read there's no harm in doing that and they, they might be able to provide you with with um some top tips but if if you don't have someone who can do that then don't be too concerned because to be honest the main the main thing I wanted to say in relation to that is don't worry about it too much um what we're mainly looking for is have you conveyed why your research matters and have you done that in an engaging way um, that would really engage a reader of the observer and capture their imagination and quite often it you know it is there might be a few sort of ragged edges in your, in your English and there might be a few imperfections but as a judge it is possible to see past that um, and see how you've explained the research have you explained it clearly fundamentally um and and have you done that in an engaging way have you used kind of you know a, an effective storytelling technique you can see that anyway so don't be overly concerned if if you don't feel as you're fluent as, as english as someone else might be um, so that's it from me so um i'll hand over to roger i think he's going to address some of, a few other questions Great, thanks Andy, uh, and thanks Gerard, and particular Sarah for those great tips actually. Um, uh, you know, if you follow that, that'll get you a long way towards uh, an entry, and I do encourage you all to give it a shot. So I've got a couple of questions here to, uh, to tackle. One is on audience engagement. It says, many news articles I've seen about PhD projects often exaggerate the impact that a specific project has in the real world i.e. cure cancer. It feels somewhat misleading as more often uh, PhDs contribute a very small piece of information to a very large complex problem. What are your thoughts about keeping a balance between conveying the importance of the research but also not patronizing the audience? So there's several things going on in there and of course you know you are all small cogs in a giant machine you know as, as am I. Um, but I have to say when I was a a Fleet Street journalist, when I was Fleet Street science editor, when I interviewed, when I went on lab visits and interviewed people, I used to love talking to the PhD students because they used to be, you know, because they did the work, first of all, that's a really important thing, and they gave me a much more vivid insight into what was going on, whereas when I met the boss of the lab, you often got a kind of slightly desiccated, dry as a Gobi Desert overview of what was going on, and it didn't make very good copies. So you guys um, are, are actually already, don't feel intimidated by your position in the great machine of science. You've actually got some great, interesting, vivid things to say. But when it comes to hype, um, I think uh, you've got to step back and understand a bit why hype happens in newspapers. It's a kind of side effect of the competitive nature of, um, you know, of, of the newspaper and press sort of world. Uh, you know, it, I would have to pitch to news editors and features editors and all my journalistic colleagues were pitching ideas as well so one sort of sort of driver of hype is that you've got to win that survival battle for space in in a newspaper of course you've got a privileged slot here in this competition so you're very lucky um but then there was a second driver of hype which is you know when you've done a, a story your news editor or your features editor would, would compare the way you tackled that story with other people. And they'd say, you know, your intro wasn't very vivid, you missed the graphic and so on. So there's a lot of pressure on journalists to make stories as vivid um, as possible. Um, and I suppose it goes back to um, the, you know, the, the, it sounds like we like hanging out in pubs because Andy, Andy mentioned the pub example, explaining it to someone to, to, to the, in, in a pub. You want them to understand it, but also you don't want to be embarrassed to meet a Nobel Prize winner in that field. Um, so you've got to try and steer um, a course between those two. I would never use the word cure in a story for obvious reasons. And I would say that, you know, you can cheat a little bit. You can raise uh, as a question, you know, could we get an effective treatment for X, Y, or Z? And then hope that one, once your reader has navigated the whole story, they'll understand actually it's quite complicated. 
it's a big deal, we might be lucky, it'll take time. So it, it's easy, really is easy actually, to nuance these messages, you know, as has come over again and again, your readers may be ignorant, but they're not stupid, and they, they'll, they'll get it, basically. Um, so, um, you know, I would really encourage you, don't be don't, don't be too humble about your position. You're doing really interesting research. You've all got something interesting to say. Do give it a shot. Second question I've been asked to look at. I have an idea of what I'd like a chapter in my PhD to be. I read a lot about it and I formed many research questions, but it feels like a stretch to say it's part of my PhD at this stage, as I would wouldn't actually be the research it for maybe two or three years. Can I still write about it? Well, the answer is yes, of course you can write about it. I mean, crikey, I've written long articles based on a five minute chat with, with a scientist. Um, so it's not about you earning um, the right to write, as it were. It's whether you know enough to talk confidently to your audience. And I think if you research a chapter in your PhD, you certainly have done uh, relative to uh, your average hack, a lot of research already on that field, and you'll have a good overview of what's um, going on. Um, and, you know, I think it's perfectly valid to signal, I find this field really interesting because of X, Y, and Z. I'm hoping to look into it later on in my doctorate and so on. I think that's fine, absolutely fine. The key thing here is just never lose sight of the audience and the reader. Will they be interested in what you're talking about? That's really the, the, the key thing. And I think that's probably enough from me. And I, I, I think we need to hear your questions uh, now as well. So back to Jurat. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Andy. Um, so yes, yeah, so we'll open up the Q&A now. So if you just go ahead and use the Q&A feature to give your questions and I will go through them and uh, hand them over to Andy and Roger uh, to answer or pick them up myself if it's something uh, I can answer. So. Uh, I've already started answering some of your questions, uh, just giving you the answer if it was re re relating to like any of the specific things from uh, uh, about uh, the process or anything like that. Uh, a couple of the other questions. So the first one, uh, can I apply this year and next year? So the answer to that is yes. Uh, you, as it says in the guidelines, you can enter the competition more than once until you win, but you must submit a different article uh, each time you enter. Uh, and, and as long as you still meet the eligible, eligibility criteria of being an MRC student, uh, then you can enter as many times. We've had people enter previously who've been shortlisted uh, both times. Uh, so, you know, that is something you can do. Uh, not a problem. Um, looking at the other questions. Uh, so here's one uh, for you, Andy and Roger, whoever would like to take this. Uh, so I'm afraid I joined the uh, late, to, uh, so, you know, ignore if this has already been asked, it hasn't been. Uh, uh, do you have any advice on how much artistic license we can use when describing places we haven't been to or details we are entirely, uh, we're not entirely sure about, but which will set the scene? So study settings, which are hard to visit due to COVID. Well, I mean, I, I, I can... Roger? I, 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 yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you, you can just do some good old fashioned research. I mean, if you've got a colleague who, who's there, you could always, you know, you could quote them in what you're saying, you know, um, uh, Professor Brainstorm says, you know, we've got an epic laboratory here with, you know, PCR machines stretching out as far as the eye can see. Um, or you could, you know, get, get someone to give you a, a, a sense of, of what it's like and paraphrase it. You don't have to credit it. You don't have to, you know, th these are all perfectly standard things. As long as you're sure you've got it right and you're not inventing it, that's, that's the key thing. So I would just use some good old fashioned journalistic practices there. Uh, what, what do you think, Andy? Yeah, I think so. Very much so. I think, uh, as Roger says, it comes down to a bit of research. Um, and there are various different ways that you might do that as say, as Roger says, speak to somebody. Um, and is there any, I mean, increasingly these days, there are the kind of resources online that would allow you to kind of um, see or picture whatever it is that you're looking to describe. Um, so yeah, it's fair game, you know, as long as it's, as long as it's um, accurate and that you've kind of done your research, that I think, I think that's absolutely fine. You can always use Google Street View or something like that, you know, and say it's, uh, 
uh, you know, tower block central LA with a couple of greasy spoon cafes next to it. Well, you know, you've seen it on Google Street View. That's fine. You don't have to have been there. They never had Google Street View in my day when I was a journalist. <laughs> Far too old for that. I don't know whether they'd even invented the internet when I started. There's a really good question, actually, from Amrit. Do you mind if I take that one? Oh, no, please, Andy. Is that okay? So uh, Amrit's asks, uh, so the guidance stresses we need to explain our research. Do we formally need to do this, uh, such as explaining each step and what was learned, or can a few brief statements explain what we did? Um, the short answer is it's the latter. So, uh, you know, keep it brief. And, uh, and again, it, um, it kind of re-emphasised what I mentioned before and thinking about the kind of, it's almost, it's, it's thinking about the different needs when you're writing uh, and who's reading it. So again, in your PhD research, when you're explaining your research and the method, you're explaining it in such a way that you're, research supervisor and anyone else if it's in a paper you know peers in the field know that you've done the research rigorously and it's robust and it will stand up but also you know there's this thing of replication potentially so could they replicate your results um, and, and recreate that you know that's the essence of you know good scientific practice um, and research um, so that's one purpose when when you're you're writing about your research method in that context. But here, really, um, it, you're not writing it in that same context. You're writing it just for people so that they can get the essence of what you did. Um, so it's really a, <laughs> to use a research term is distillation, distillate uh, you know kind of distilling the core aspects of what you did, as you just explained actually, um, as you just said, and. Um, just describing those so um, you don't get too bogged down in the minutiae of exactly what you did and in what order and how often and that kind of thing because you know it, you people are reading it for a different purpose I think that's really well put I mean I, I don't please don't write a wikipedia entry trying to explain <laughs> things you know what you're trying to do as Andy says is just give the gist of what this is about so it's a, it's a kind of like a, a need to know basis. You know, ask yourself, does the reader really need to know this stuff? If they don't, don't mention it. You've got to keep a clean, simple narrative from one end of the story that hooks the, their interest to the outro. And, and that, that's, the, that's the key agenda. It's not trying to, it's not going to be like a kind of the, the mental equivalent of a stock cube where you pop this thousand words into someone's head and they can reconstruct every nuance of your research. Of course, that's never going to happen. It's just to give them a broad um, and reasonably accurate um, insight into what's going on. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, so I'll go on to the next question that we have here um, is, I have an idea of how to open my article with something very personal to me, which would take a few paragraphs. This leads into my work, but isn't directly related. Would it be better to start with something more directly related, possibly at, at the sacrifice of a personal link and hook, or go for it and only start talking directly about my work halfway through, possibly risking losing the reader's interest halfway through or seeming unfocused? Do you want me to pick that one up or do you want to... I mean, I, I, well, all I'd say is um, you don't want to bolt, you, you don't want to do a bait and switch. And by that, I mean, say something like, you know, uh, some extraordinary personal story. And then the rest of what you're talking about doesn't connect with it at all. It's very hard for me and Andy to sort of respond to what you said without really seeing exactly what you've got in mind. But I think a personal way in is always great because essentially, readers are people and they're interested in other people and what I'd say is well, write it by all means and then see if you can um, if you can simplify it and cut it back a bit so the intro doesn't get in the way of the main point of the story it sort of whets the appetite of the reader um, but but I wouldn't invest more than a couple of paragraphs in it I don't know what do you think Andy of course we're working on very incomplete information here yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think those are good points. Um, and uh, um, as Roger's kind of pointing towards, it really depends on how it's done. Um, it can be something that's quite challenging to get right. But when you do get it right, it can be very effective, very powerful. Because, you know, we've talked about before that people relate to others on a, on a sort of more individual basis. 
Um, and if they can see you as a human being, then um, that could be a really powerful, engaging route into the story. But I think I think just 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 a sort of couple. So I would encourage you to do it, but just as a couple of things to sort of bear in mind. And, and as Roger said, um, try to avoid writing too many sort of paragraphs on that personal story that then makes a sudden kind of about turn to the content of the. Um, the article itself so there needs to be a smooth transition and that opening bit shouldn't be too long really so that readers are what you don't want to get into a position of is readers thinking oh well why am i this is kind of interesting but why are you telling me about this um it, very quickly it needs to kind of make that that switch but if you can get it right as i say it can be something really powerful and i would always i would always always encourage people to be creative maybe take a few risks, you know, and, and see how it sits, see how it works. You know, again, as it, no matter how experienced you are, sometimes you have to write something, look at it in the cold light of day and think, does this work? How can I improve it? And, and can I make it work? So, so have a go, see, see how it works. You could actually do a little trial. You could write it with your personal intro as, as, as tight as you can get it. And then you can just lock the personal intro off and then you can experiment on your poor hapless friends in the pub with each version and see what they think. See, everything leads back to the pub. Have you noticed that? <laughs> 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 this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Andy and Roger. Uh, the next question, what are the odds of winning? Uh, so I can answer this. Um, well, it varies year to year, really. It depends on the number of entries we get. Last year, we received 140 entries, which was the highest we've received uh, in the awards history. Uh, so it kind of depends on that. There is 10 shortlisted uh, every year. Um, and out of that, out of those 10, one is the winner. And then there's also a, a runner-up prize, but also a commended prizes as well. Uh, and everyone that's shortlisted uh, also receives a uh, a cash prize at a, at a, at a certain level. So, um, you know, what are your odds of winning? It will vary depending on the number of entries we get. Uh, however, I, I would encourage you to enter, you know, cause there, you, can, you may still be shortlisted. You could still win runner up or get commended. And there's different cash prizes for those levels. We also, even if you're, if you're another winning article that's being published in the observer, we take all of the shortlisted articles and create a nice little a digital booklet that we then uh, publish on our website that we share with, uh, you know, various other um, uh, aff uh, affiliations and institutions. And we also, um, you know, uh, Roger has been kind enough to, you know, write a, a blog for the Science Museum uh, for the past years about all of those shortlisted. So, you know, there is recognition there. There is other things that will really give value as a PhD student and, and also as, as an exercise to be able to, you know, uh, write an article uh, for communicating your science to a, to a lay or non-scientific audience and using this uh, kind of opportunity to kind of practice and hone those skills that will hopefully pay uh, dividends later on in your research career. So I would say, you know, uh, despite the odds, do I would encourage you to enter. There are other other things you can uh, uh, benefit from from doing so. I think uh, the odds are a hundred percent if if you <laughs> write um, uh, uh, an entry that the editor of the Observer would sell their grandmother to get in the newspaper. How about that? <laughs> uh, true. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, we have so we're coming on the last couple of questions. Uh, do you have, do you think there's some value in also explaining the research experience, uh, i.e. I work with big data, so my laptop is my lab? Uh, it, it so depends on the details. If it's like, you know, 10 a.m. staring at laptop, feeling a bit bored, 11 a.m. went to get coffee, you know, what, I mean, you, you've got to um, think of quite a creative, I, I think giving people a sense of the research experience is, is a great thing to do. Um, so long as it's not um, trying to convey um, the extreme monotony <laughs> of doing certain aspects of research. But I know that, um, you know, people's experiences, uh, you know, I used to have to, in my uh, research projects, sleep 
um, in the in the beam hall of a nuclear reactor next to um, heavy soap bubbles. So I could make that sound kind of quite fun and, and cool. Um, I, I think screen work is, is quite a tough thing to bring to life. Uh, if you could do it, I absolutely love to, to read it because it would be quite challenging. Well, well, I mean, Andy, have you seen anyone um, talking about big data manipulation and making it the sexiest thing ever? <laughs> yeah, it's quite a tough ask. Um, but um, I think potentially it's doable. I mean, a, a lot of stories, um, I mean, with, uh, Roger's example there of um, uh, like where he's sleeping and, and the giant soap bubbles is, is a nice sort of illustration, actually, that um, I think what people are interested in is the unusual, the quirky, the different, the kind of unexpected um, putting your reader there. And I think that can work really effectively. So if you if you think about how you do research, um, think about how someone else would see it because uh, it's you know quite often when when you're engaged in doing research day after day after day it becomes the normal really but you know often you work in incredible places incredible labs uh, with equipment that's incapable of doing mind blowing things if you can convey exactly what that equipment does the power of it um, the capabilities of it and what it's like to be there what an environment is like I, I think that can be a, an engaging routine um, but yeah I think it's a case of just um, showing what's unusual different and, and kind of um, you know sort of special about that environment that you work in uh, or, or the equipment that you use uh, as well so think think kind of creativity creatively about that aspect of what you do. Thank you very much. A couple of questions that have come in around animal research. Uh, one, would it be acceptable to write about conf a conflicted personal emotions one feels when carrying out difficult uh, uh, but ultimately necessary animal work? Uh, and also, uh, what's your uh, recommendations about limiting the gory details <laughs> regarding what specific things they do? So uh, Andy, Raja, I don't know if you want to if you have any well, thoughts I on that. I mean, I, I can remember the days when, um, you know, uh, if you wanted to comment on animal research, th there was literally one or two people who would um, comment in public. Colin Blakemore was, was, was famous for, for this, to, to, to give the rational defense of vivisection. Um, I've got to say, personally, I gave up biology because I hated dissection. Um, uh, I, but I think it's incredibly important to be open about this and transparent. Um, so I think um, I think it's perfectly acceptable. In fact, it's really interesting to talk about the mixed emotions about doing uh, animal research. And, and I know um, you know someone I've just written a book with. You know, um, uh, tells her students to respect the mouse embryo. Um, you know, not least because you you you're, you're, you you could be distorting your results if you don't take it as seriously as working, say, with human uh, embryos as well. When it comes to gory details, I think you've got to be slightly careful here um, because you, you don't want to sort of give these details in a way that conveys that you seem to be relishing this, this side of... Uh, and I think you have to think about what the audience can take. There was, um, when I joined the Telegraph a million years ago, Lord Deeds, who just edited it, used to have a phrase which he talked about a marmalade dropper. And the Telegraph used to like... Um, gruesome details of court cases up to a point and the point was you're reading your telegraph over breakfast and you read such a shocking detail that you drop your toast and marmalade I think that's what Lord Deeds is on about so I, I think you've got to again it all goes back to the observer reader um but but uh, but openness is is the key a Andy what, what do you think yeah I mean I, I think um I, just to re-emphasize what Roger said I think um uh, I think it's fine to be, uh, and, and in some respects, maybe quite important to be open about conflicting emotions um, when, when you're doing this type of research. Um, and I, I think it will allow readers to see into the thought process as well that sits behind it um, and, and um, how you kind of rationalise it maybe. So I think I think that is important. And yeah, I think just on, on sort of detail, um, uh, it, it's really a nature of what, um, what's needed to tell the story, really. And, um, you know, quite often 
that a line has to be drawn when it's not sort of adding something to the story in some respects. I mean, it's it's fine to sort of describe a process if that's intrinsic to people understanding what you've done. Um, but I think I think that's that's perhaps the core aspect of what you need to focus on, really. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that helps. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Roger. Um, there's a question that uh, has gotten a few likes, and I think it would be it would be a question that uh, you know that'd be worth uh, getting advice from both of you on. Is uh, do you have any advice about approaching newspapers and magazines if we don't win? Uh, you know, if or just around the general idea of if, if, if researchers want to sidestep into journalism, what advice would you give on how they can do this? Yeah, should I, should I go with this one first, and then you you might be able, you might have some additional thoughts. Go, go on, Andy, as well, Roger. Um, so um, the um, journalistic world is very different to the academic publishing world, um, and and if if for my money gets it the right way round. <laughs> so you with with journalism, you pitch a story. You don't write the entire thing, and then someone says oh, I don't, don't like that, or something's not right, or X, Y, and Z, retrospectively, you pitch a story. So if you are interested in um, pitching your story to a publication, and I think, you know, within reason, I would encourage you to do that. And, and you know, most publications these days have um, guidelines for, you know, often they'll be described as guidelines for freelance writers. Um, and often they've got some quite useful pointers as to what they're looking for so it's well worth reading those um, I, I would encourage you to do that but if you get to the point where you think right I would like to pitch this to a publication pick which publication you would like to pitch it to because again the etiquette is that you only pitch it to one publication rather than doing it to several and, and a pitch really should be no more than about 100 150 words something really short sharp succinct um, that again, you're, you're trying to um, grab the attention of a news editor um, and, and um, make it clear why that story would be of interest to their readers fundamentally. Um, so um, have a think about that and, and how you might sell the story in that kind of in that kind of context. But overall, I'd encourage you to do that. So yeah, I, I think if you look at um say New Scientist or Wired, um, they, they've got guidelines for how to pitch stories, which are very useful. Um, I, I know there's a love of doing everything by email. Um, obviously I, I would email first, but I would try and talk to the person who's doing the commissioning. As Andy says, it's a real heart sink when you get a, a piece that someone's put a lot of effort into and you think, mm, yeah, it's not really right or it's the wrong style or it's too long or we covered this last week and so on, you get a huge amount of intelligence actually talking to the person who's doing the commissioning. So if you can get a five minute chat with them and get their interest, um, you know, they might, they might say, well, actually, I, I want this to be a first person account. Actually, could you give an overview of the field? Could you use this new story um, that's just come out today as the, as the peg to hang the whole story on? Um, you know, could you not go into this bit? You'll get a huge amount of insight from, from, from just that, a very brief chat with that person as well. So, um, but please don't, don't send in, um, you know, uh, your, your main focus that you've worked on for six months and expect, because it usually just depresses people at the other end, because they're, they're I, I can sort of count on the fingers of one hand in uh, 22 years articles that have been um, not commissioned that I've run in the, the Telegraph. And they were usually from people like Stephen Hawking, you know, so um, uh, anyway, there we are. That, that's, uh, uh, but I think Andy, Andy sort of got, got the nail on the head there, but br brief summary is the way forward. Thank you both. Uh, um, we're approaching the last few minutes of the webinar and um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so uh, what I'll do is I'll give um, my last few um, uh, reminders before. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, I had a separate uh, message from a colleague uh, who's sitting in on the webinar. Uh, and uh, she has said that 
we can put you in, uh, in touch with our press office if you want to try and pitch an article to a newspaper or willing to be a spokesperson in the field of research. So that's one way. So um, what, what I'll do in my in the slide I show you next, I'll give you an email address that you can, all, all of you can email if you want, if you're interested in that. Okay, so let me just share my screen uh, real quick. I'll go to... All right, so just a few reminders. Uh, one, uh, again, please do go to uh, uh, the competition guidelines page and read it. There's some valuable information in there. Uh, it tells you, you know, the criteria, the eligibility uh, requirements, uh, the judging criteria, some helpful advice and tips, links to uh, previous year's uh, articles, the ones that have been shortlisted, and Sarah's winning article from The Observer is also linked there as well. Uh, as Roger has said before, you know, the best way to know your audience is, you know, to read, buy a copy of The Observer and read it. And so reading last year's winner will, you know, even be more beneficial to that. Uh, then we go into uh, telling you, you know, formatting uh, uh, kind of rules and regulations and then give you a link on how to enter and what you need to do. So this link is given here. I will put this into the chat. Oh, sorry. I, I clicked the link accidentally. So <laughs> I'm just going to reboot this here. Oh, it's... Sorry, some technical difficulties here. Uh, let me see if I can just share it the other way. Okay, there we go. Apologies there, uh, but I'll put this link into the chat. Uh, it's also um, in any of the announcements you've got gotten about this, but let me just put this into the chat for you. So that's there in the chat for anyone that wants that link. That's straight to the 2021 guidelines page on the website. Um, if you have any questions or issues, please do get in touch with uh, uh, the Science Writing Prize at UKRI.org. Um, and um, you know any follow-up questions and anything, uh, we will uh, be able to answer as soon as we can. Uh, the deadline to enter is 5, uh, 5 p.m. on the 21st of June. Uh, that is a Monday, so you will have a weekend to work on, you know, your final drafts and edits uh, if needed. We specifically in the pub, Jurat, in the pub, in, in the pub, exactly in the pub. We we specifically, you know, schedule it that it falls on a Monday, so you have that weekend to be at the pub and uh, do your final draft and uh, put in your final touches there. Um, again, this this uh, recording was. Um, oh, sorry, this webinar was recorded. And um, so was the last one. I'll share both, as I've said, in an email this week to all of you that have registered for these webinars. And then we'll also upload them onto YouTube and share them uh, via our Twitter account and, our, and put them on the guidelines page on our website for, for the uh, award as well. Uh, but when I send you the email uh, for the, with these links to these recordings, I will also, also give you a link to a short survey, about five minutes, uh, and so if you could please give us your feedback, your feedback is invalu invaluable to us. You know, Andy, Roger, and I look at them, uh, you know, we decide, you know, we take in what you've said and we change what we do and how we can improve things. So, you know, your feedback is very important to us. So if you could just spare five minutes uh, when you get that email and just take that uh, survey for us, I'll leave it open. It'll give you a deadline by which to, uh, by which to take it by. Uh, we won't leave it open for, forever, but, you know, a couple of weeks. And so if you could please take that survey and give us your feedback, that'd be great. Uh, other than that, uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you to Roger and Andy uh, for joining us and you know, answering these questions and giving their valuable advice uh, to all of you. And thank you to all of you for joining, for taking the time. I, I encourage you all to enter, uh, you know, and give this a shot. Uh, it's really it's such a valuable thing to be able to, you know, even like I said, even as a former research student to have this kind of opportunity to kind of work and hone on this, this really uh, important skill, which is, you know, being able to communicate your research work to those that are not, you know, experts or within your field is so uh, invaluable. Uh, but thank you for joining. Um, and yes, we, we are looking forward to reading all of your entries and uh, reading a lot of great ones. 
Um, so thank you, Andy, Roger, thank you. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. And good really luck. Really looking everyone. forward to reading these entries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good luck, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, good luck. Cheerio. Bye-bye.